Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining this webinar. Uh, my name is Nicholas, and I'm sitting here at Imaginize with my colleague, Marie. Uh, we are organizing this session today because uh, in recent years, several clinical teams have adopted our company's adaptive optics retinal camera, the RTX1, for investigations in inherited retinal diseases. These studies have produced dozens of scientific papers, but today in this webinar, we propose to focus on personal insight with three clinicians who kindly agreed to share their own experience and vision on the use of AO cameras in IRDs. This will be a 30 minute discussion, including time for interaction with the audience in the second part of the session. So please type any question or comment that you may have in the Q&A. And now let's introduce our guests. Hello, everyone. So for the roundtable discussion today, we are pleased to welcome Kyoko Gocho, who is an ophthalmologist. She works at the Quinze-Vin Eye Hospital in Paris in the imagery research team led by Professor Michel Pack. And she also collaborates with the Kobe Eye Center in Japan. Previously, she worked with Dr. Shuhei Kamea at the Nippon Medical School, also in Japan, where she published a number of studies on AO imaging in IRDs. Our second guest is Daniel Rochandel, an ophthalmologist at the Lions Eye Institute in Perth, Australia. He is currently working on his PhD thesis in the team led by Professor Fred Chen. His project is about monitoring the progression of retinitis pigmentosa with multiple imaging modalities including adaptive optics. And finally, we also welcome Melanie Kemp, an optometrist and research assistant at the University Eye Hospital in Tübingen, Germany, in the group led by Katharina Stingel. She performs adaptive optics examinations for several clinical studies in IRDs, including gene therapy trials. So my first question to the three of you would be, when you began using adaptive optics imaging, what was your motivation? What were the main reasons that drove you to use it in your investigations and especially in IRDs? Melanie, do you want to start? Yeah, hi. So thank you so much at first for your nice introduction. So um, in our clinic, we see a lot of patients with hereditary retinal diseases and we have a lot of clinical trials running and therefore we are looking for methods and examinations that are sensitive enough to detect um, already smallest changes. So um, we know that in general for hereditary retinal degenerations, um, the optical imaging of the retina is essential. And um, due to the fact that the degeneration begins on a cellular level, um, the RTX1 revealed really new possibilities for us. So we are really happy that we can use the RTX1 for our um, study patients and also for our patients in the daily clinic. So um, on the one hand, um, to identify the earliest changes um, on the disease and also the early stages of a disease, and also for the better understanding of the um, pathogenesis of the disease. So for example, we had one patient with a mutation in the um, CRX gene, and he was um, just in carrier of the gene. And he had um, still a good visual acuity and visual field and so on, um, but the central cone density was already um, severely reduced. And um, then the central cones become visible, what we can see also on the slide. And um, smallest changes in the retinal capillaries or irregularities like an changed cone density and increased spacing or changed reflectivity <coughs> becomes observable um, with the AO imaging. So, for example, the volumen ratio of the vessel is, is already established as a wallet biomarker for hypertension. Um, but we could also observe in almost all our um, RP patients um, that they have a narrowing of the arterial arterioles. And um, the AO imaging is also a potential possibility to examine retinal inflammatory or immune responses in a non-invasive way after um, a gene therapy was applied. So for example, by visualizing immune cells and their behavior over the time, um, as well as the possibility to investigate vessel changes, new insights into the retinal immune um, reactions are possible. So of course, all the questions about the immune response are of high, are of high interest for us. 
And um, here on the slide, you can see that um, we can observe a lot of things in, in our patients. So these are just some exp um, examples. And um, yeah, I just wanted to show that all these changes are um, of high interest for our clinical trials, um, where even slight changes might be important for the safety or the efficiency of a study or a therapy. Yes, I see it's a really interesting uh, to, to know why you started using it, using it at Tübingen. And uh, what, what about uh, Daniel in Australia? Hello everyone and thanks for having me tonight. Um, so we are currently using uh, the Arctic Swan machine for adaptive optics imaging of patients with IRDs for several purposes. Well, the first one is to uh, determine the patterns of photoreceptor loss because uh, we can see photoreceptors using adaptive optics and which is not possible with OCT. So uh, we can use these imagings if, if Nicholas can show the slide. Uh, we can use these imagings for uh, doing a genotype-phenotype correlation, which is very important to us. And also, uh, if, if you have like um, uh, functional tests like microperimetry or multifocal ERG, then you can use it for genotype-phenotype correlation studies. And you can see these two examples on the left side. Uh, we have two patients, one of them with severe ellipsoid zone loss, which uh, has also a, a high protoporocent ring. And you can see in the cone density map, there is a significant loss of cone photoreceptors. But in the second patient, the lower one, uh, although the ellipsoid zone is normal, but we still can see some uh, severe loss of cone photoreceptors in, in the second patient. Uh, the second uh, aim for using the adaptive optics machine is uh, to detect the minimal changes in clinical, in, in preclinical stages in patients. Like in this, exa in this example, this, there are two asymptomatic patients with CRB1 mutation that has normal vision, normal retinal sensitivity, and uh, normal OCT and fundus autofluorescence, but we could detect some uh, cone mosaic changes using adaptive optics imaging, and it was useful to, this, to diagnose these two patients. And the last one for us was uh, using this uh, cone mosaic uh, parameters for, for measuring the longitudinal changes at cellular level, for this stage, at this stage, we are using this for natural history studies, and we showed that there was a significant loss of cone photoreceptors during only six months. But for the next stage, we, we are going to use this uh, uh, in our clinical trials, our future clinical trials as well. Thank you very much. And uh, what about Kyoko in Japan? Why did you start using the adaptive optics camera? Yeah, thank you very much. So my name is Kyoko Kocho. So in my previous work in Japan, so my team research topic was IRD with Professor Kameya, and we needed the most precise phenotype information in this patient. So this was my motivation to start using AO in IRDs. So detail of the pathological change that we could see with the other imaging technique, like such as OCT, when we have doubt, then when sometimes you know, AO then solved and gave us more you know, detail and we can get more close to the answer, what we want to see. So please show this slide, Nicola, please. Yes, so then, yes, this is the normal case. And the next one, mm -hmm. yes, so, so please go to the next. Yes, so when we started AO, so small pathological mo modification and the measure the speed of these changes. And it was, first I studied in France, it was at the, for the MDs, but for the IRDs, the first, you know, to see was the cone mosaic phenotypes. So for this one was the PCD and the cone disappearance and distinct foveal cones. And next, please. Next one. And the buried area, and we can do measurement for the photoreceptors. And next one, please. And then we can see the, some special features such as starry night cone pattern in OMD. Next slide, please. So for the other features, also it was very interesting to see like the crystalline deposit, including cone cluster in DH crystalline dystrophy. And next one, please. 
the original fold in original cases to see the change. It was very interesting. And the next one, yes. And the microcystic in the ADOA. So, and the measure the speed of these all cone and the other change in order to know the prognosis. And more generally, understanding how the pathology developed in the retina was very interesting for us. Such understanding is important as the present time when therapy are becoming available for IRD. And for testing new therapies, we need to know the natural history of the disease, as Daniel said, so including at early stage, and we need to measure very slow progression using adaptive policies. Thank you. Yes, so we have been highly impressed by these stunning adaptive optics images in your many presentations and publications from your groups. Uh, so could you share your experience on how to obtain the best possible images with the adaptive optics camera, in particular in the IRD patients? Uh, maybe Daniel wants to start. All right, thank you. Well, um, technically doing the adaptive optics imaging is, is very easy. It looks like other uh, ophthalmic devices. And uh, so, but there are some uh, special considerations for these patients. And uh, to my experience, the best, the, the most important aspect is patient selection. So if you do patient selection properly, then you can be sure that you can get high quality images. Um, so if you just exclude those patients that are not good candidates, but uh, many of these patients have this um, uh, exclusion criteria. So you might be interested to do this imaging in those patients as well. So it's possible and you can get fairly good images. But uh, specifically, I can mention like uh, pupil dilation. Uh, although uh, the imaging is possible with a four millimeter pupil, but I would recommend doing it with a much uh, a bigger pupil, like six millimeters. And also keeping patients centered on the fixation target during the examination and uh, a good patient education helps you to get uh, good quality images. And also the other factor is choosing the best imaging depth. And um, so you can choose anything between 40 to 100, even less or more for photoreceptor imaging. But um, uh, sometimes you see that in, in, in some patients, like uh, uh, smaller numbers can get, give you better image quality. And uh, you can uh, try several imaging depths and see which one uh, it gives you the best quality. And also you have to ask patient to keep steady during the imaging because uh, the imaging is performed during four seconds. Of course, using the, this, the, the uh, current a camera, but I know that there are newer camera that can do the imaging during two seconds, so it's much easier. So you need to ask patient for be steady just for two seconds. And also you have to consider the ocular surface conditions like dry eye, like ocular surface irregularities, and you can um, like use uh, artificial uh, um, teardrops. Mm -hmm. Uh, to uh, overcome these problems. And also uh, the other thing that we do in our clinic is uh, we, in our imaging protocol uh, includes doing multiple imagings with overlapping areas. So you can do uh, the imaging multiple times and choose the image with the best quality, which gives you the highest number of cones to be uh, studied. Yes, so it's very interesting. Maybe Melanie can also uh, elaborate on the, how they do it in tubing again. Thank you so much. Also, Daniel, I don't have that much actually to add, but um, in general, it is useful um, to acquire the AO images in the beginning of a patient's visit. So as a, uh, our study patients, they have a really long day in our clinic. So um, in the beginning, the concentration of the patient is still good. And also the um, fixation is normally more stable than in the evening or after a long day. And of course, it is important to instruct the patient correctly and to ensure that the patient um, sits as comfortable as possible. And for example, to take care that he can always blink um, when the yellow fixation cross is um, gone, so when it disappears, that the patient can blink. And um, like Daniel said, another important factor is the tear film, because a good tear film is always necessary to obtain um, a good image. And when your patient has dry eyes, you should apply additional eye drops. And that's why we, for example, um, never acquire um, um, AO images after the ocular examination or the measurement of the IOP, 
because when the eye is um, because then the eye is really dry and the cornea is also slightly deformed from the measurement of the IOP. So that's why we normally acquire the images before. Yes. And this is very, uh, very interesting. And maybe uh, we, we will go, go to Kyoko also advice uh, on that. Okay, so um, actually I already saw there were some question about the, you know, for the nystagmus case. <laughs> so, and, and please, I, I, yes, so Melanie and Daniel have already covered the, the, how the corneal surface is very important for, you know, and the tips already, you know, they already saw. So I often ask my patient to cooperate with me. So when they have nystagmus, Nicola, will you please show the slide? Yes, so sometimes I ask them to block the movement by slightly pressing the lower eyelid with their finger by themselves so that they don't have to be scared so they can control. So it is very simple and I found that it, it often works. So even for the kids, when I explain, well, just not to push too much, just to touch so then they, they can control it rather well. So. And when they have ptosis, I ask them, like old people, so that they can just lift up the whole, you know, and it also works. And sometimes, of course, the hair is coming in between. So then I ask them to hold or sometimes, you know, so it also works. So, and also, so for the cataract is also one of the one, one for the RP cases we, we see often. So then about the cataract, I recommend to try AO imaging in patients. Still, it's, it, we, we can see, but of course, PCO case, it's very difficult. And uh, for the IOL, yes, we, we can try, but uh, because of the optic is not the same. So, so after cataract surgery, um, always uh, I recommend a large diameter of capsulohexis to make Bit larger CCC for to ask for the operator. Oh, I when I do yes, I make it as much as possible, and it's better for the patient vision and also better for after the imaging the retina. And one more thing, next slide, please. Yes, and also to know where they are the fixation point in the retina for the patient is very important to know. So. Like usually I start using with the, the very easy task for the patient. So then I try to ask them to see the just, you know, center of the class to make it the center, it's most easiest. Uh, the, it's the e easy for, for patient. And, and so, yes. Yeah, yeah, so th thank you for these uh, very nice images again and for these really useful uh, guidelines and tips. I'm sure everyone finds uh, everyone who uses AO camera finds it uh, useful. And now my third and last question is about the applications of adaptive optics. So where do you see the highest value or highest benefit of this technology? Uh, Kyoko will start. Okay, so this, uh, so I'd like to show our slide. The next slide, please. Like with our previous year, I worked with Professor Kamiya and our team so published the, this RP autosomal dominant RP cases with the HQ1 mutation. So usually these mutations RP cases start to show the symptom in their 40s, but this AO adaptive optics, so we found already in 20 years old has the um, increase uh, decreasing of the photoreceptors. So then we could detect the, the early cone loss Please click next one. Nicola, please next one, please. Ah, no. Sorry. <laughs> so then the this case was the even the visual and the visual acuity was good over 2020, but already 40% the loss was quantified in such cases. So the next one, please. The early detection and the early diagnosis, it will make more timely treatment before significant vision loss occurs. So this advantage for the future traffic approaches, but already now early diagnosis can help selecting patient 
for trial. So measure progression over short time period, which provides more precise prognosis and makes it a fine tool for natural history studies and the therapy trial in IRD. So, and then maybe yeah, uh, so. we will switch to, to Melanie also. Yeah, thank you. Um, so for us, the highest, uh, highest value is that we can observe our study patients over a longer period of time and that we can um, notice if there are smallest changes over the time on a cellular level. And that is especially important for us in the um, interventional trials. For example, we have been observing our patients um, treated by Luxturna, which is the first approved um, gene therapy for almost two years now. And so far we have been able to record both. So the positive effects and also side effects or complications um, that have arisen. So for example, we could observe an homogeneous and changed appearance of the cone mosaic after the injection, uh, which can be explained by a disruption of the um, outer retinal barrier due to the pleb which arises from the injection. Um, but however, we could observe a stabilization of that mosaic between the second and the fourth week after the surgery, which we can see um, on the right side. Um, but um, in the OCT and in the fundus images, of course, we couldn't observe these findings. And um, furthermore, we use the AO imaging um, to examine retinal inflammatory and um, immune responses. And for the example, in our Luxturna patients, we couldn't observe any signs um, of immune responses. And we also couldn't observe changes in the wall lumen ratio of the arterioles. Um, despite that, we could observe in one patient already two weeks after the um, gene therapy was um, applied, a better reflectivity of the cones and a more defined photoreceptor mosaic in the AO imaging, which we can see here on the um, right side. And in comparison to the OCT scan, the forming of the foveal uh, layering was apparent. And five weeks after the surgery, the layering of the central fovea improved further. And we could really good observe these in the AO imaging. And in another patient, which we can see on the left side, um, unfortunately, a post-operative um, scaring was observable after the injection. Um, however, we could observe also a stabilization and also a partially recovery after six months in the um, AO imaging and also in the OCT. So um, for us, the highest value is actually to uh, detect and observe our patients over a longer period of time in natural history studies or in interventional trials. Yes, this is a very interesting. And uh, Daniel, what is the, the most benefit for, for you, for you? Yeah, I think uh, Kirka and Melanie already covered everything. So I just sum up. So for every specialist who works with IR, IRD patients, it's uh, really important to detect disease progression and to see if this is, uh, is progressing or not. So AO imaging can reduce the time to detect any meaningful disease progression as uh, we observed in our patients. So you can see in the right image that uh, even though the ellipsoid zone span didn't change over the six month period, but the condensity showed significant decline over the same time. So it can uh, help accelerating clinical trial timelines. And also the other thing that is, uh, was very uh, interesting to me was that uh, conventionally, uh, uh, it's believed that uh, in rod cone dystrophy, cone uh, cells are degenerating following rods. So it's a secondary cone degeneration. But as you can see in the left side picture, although the ellipsoid zone is, is normal, which shows that there are photoreceptors, mainly rods in the peripheral area, but still we can detect central cone uh, loss, which shows that there might be some mechanisms of primary cone loss in these patients with rod cone dystrophy. So that's, that's all for me. Well, this was all uh, very interesting. Thank you very much for sharing your experience and your vision with us today. Uh, I can see that he, it has inspired some questions from the audience. So now uh, I will let uh, Nicola uh, present some questions. Yes, yeah, so this is, I think the, There was a question from uh, Shanta Sa Safer from about um, uh, nystagmus, and uh, I think uh, 
Yoko uh, already answered that question. So I will go to, to the next one and, and maybe later we will elaborate by email on, on Ms. Tagmus. Alina Dumitrescu asked how difficult is to use this? Uh, oh no, this is the question on, on Ms. Tagmus, sorry. I made a mistake. Uh, I'll go to the next. Uh, from Morteza, Morteza V. Fart, how much it how much of the retinal area is captured by uh, RTX1 camera? So maybe I can answer this one. It's a four by four degree uh, image that you get every time. Um, and is there any, uh, from the same uh, attendee, is there any refractive error effect on AO camera imaging? Um, so uh, does any panelist want to elaborate on this? Like, yeah, I for example, uh, while well, you see uh, different images in a uh, high myopia, for example. Mm. Yes, actually, with this machine has the some, you know, we can use the battle system to correct to the refractive error. So we can try the, um, even for the my peak strong one, or usually normally for the astigmas, we can take the good images. Yes, and I, yes, it's not the answer. I, it is what I can answer. <laughs> yes. uh, okay, so you, you already <laughs> answered the next question that from <laughs> Thomas Thielen. Thielen, yes. Yes. Uh, is it useful to wear spectacles during AO imaging in case of strong astigmatism? So we, we, we have an adaptive optic system that uh, can easily compensate for up to five or six diopters of astigmatism. So usually it's it's not it's not useful um, so another question from Adrian Adrian Vincent in Canada how much periphery can you reach with RTX one so what, what is your experience yes when I use outside of the you know the fixation target not inside to make the fixation target outside so that we can reach to the periphery but because of the, even we dilate, the pupil size will be because of the tilted the pupil, it's going to be smaller. So sometimes there is a limit, but I don't know how much I try, 20, 30, something I already tried. Degree. 30 degrees. 30 degrees, yes. It was, it was okay. Any other comment on this, uh, Daniel or Melanie? Yeah, we have done uh, imaging up to nine degrees from Fovia, so it's totally 18 degrees um, uh, diameter. So we, we, we could get good quality images and um, analyze the cone density up to, up to nine degrees, but we haven't tried uh, further yeah. on the Fovia. Okay, thank you. So I'm going back to the question of Shanta. I made confusion before. Can you please elaborate on the use of uh, AO imaging in ADOA, autosomal dominant optic atrophy? Kyoko, maybe? Yes, I took the images of the um, like um, microcystic macular edema. So it was very impressive because, and also see the photosystem images, but I didn't try to see the Nafiba bundles, so I don't know what was their question, you know, what I should answer. <laughs> yes. Well, I, I remember your, your paper on this and uh, the, yes. the very uh, uh, striking uh, microcyst that became mm -hmm. visible with the uh, AO. And yes, the, before uh, it was only by uh, on fast OCT, so and the IR, the imaging the, in the SLO, they showed the, there was some darkness around the foveal area. So then we found it was correlated with this microcystic edema was the same, you know, where we can detect in the infrared images and the on fast OCT. Okay, so now it's going to be time to wrap up. So uh, you have to answer this one by yes or no from uh, Marie van Schoenveld. Uh, does uh, AO imaging reduce your use of multifocal ERG, for mm -hmm. example, in OMD? So yes, no? <laughs> mm, because we like the ERG, so we, to be sure, we used both in Japan with Kamiya-sensei. Yeah. 
yes, but the, before, once we took the AO image, so then it was, we thought maybe it might be already, it was much easier, you know, for, for us to see. Okay, yeah. so, but you still continue using both, probably. Yes. <laughs> okay, yeah, thank also. you very much. <laughs> so, I'm sorry, but I'm afraid we might have not taken all questions. So, in case there is a still unanswered question, we will follow up by email. Now, many, many thanks to, to the, our panelists for sharing a lot of precious uh, insight in a, in a very little time. And also, thank you, Marine and uh, Manon at Imaginize for your work. And uh, thank you all attendees very much. See you next time. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>